All right, welcome. Uh, trying to get back in the saddle here. Uh, this will be a, uh, well, somewhat detailed review now of uh, Decision Games Battles in the East. I'm going to be focusing on the system rules. The scenario rules are pretty much one page, mainly the setup and stuff. <coughs> so I'll probably go over bagration on that too. Um, and what I've done also is I've kind of cobbled together, well, put together <coughs> a vassal mod. One hasn't come out from Decision Games yet. So I've <coughs> felt I needed to uh, go ahead and make one myself. <coughs> one disclaimer on the vassal mod. <coughs> the map boards are mounted, which which is fine from a quality point of view. <coughs> Just a means I can't take it down to my local office store and get them scanned on their oversized scanner. So I had to fall back and just use my phone <coughs> to make a picture so you will see it's kind of a little <coughs> lighting's different. I'm not very good at taking photos, but it is more than workable for uh, playing it out uh, via Vassal here. So, And <coughs> I've only made counters for the Bagration scenario. I haven't done the other one yet, so uh, that's kind of limited. But actually, why am I interested in kind of plunging into battles in the east. There were some other things I did have on my plate, but uh, it's a relatively new series from Decision Games, but uh, the interest, and it's based on some of their old successes. We see references to Spy Classics, Army Group South, Panzer Group Guderian, and then as they were updated in the Cobra uh, game, too. All of these are solid games, solid histories. You can look them up, so Decision Games is making an attempt at uh, kind of updating these rules, these systems, these popular systems in the past, probably even the present, <coughs> to uh, to modern times, and then starting to build out a number of games with scenarios. This is only volume one. Um, maybe at the end I will pull up the information on, I think, so far they've announced four volumes, potentially, so we're looking at eight scenarios, at least eight battles. So I'm very interested uh, with this first volume of putting the system through its paces, to uh, then decide if it's worthwhile to continue collecting this series. If this this potentially becomes the Eastern Front version of OSG's Napoleonics, um, that's of course saying a lot. But even though uh, you know a good solid uh, feels like operational levels um, Eastern Front um, rule set, so uh, this will be interesting. One other claim: if anybody's got a good scan graphic of the maps for this. Uh, if you don't mind, shoot it my way. I can easily swap this picture out. I just don't have a quick and dirty way to get a nice scan of this, and nobody's posted a picture yet of the entire map on BGG. But with that said, and I previously did a video where I didn't open the box on this of the game, so like I said, now I'm just going to go and come through and kind of look at the rules in preparation for playing the Bagration scenario here. Um, so just coming down... First off, we got the game scale three to five miles, uh, five to eight clicks, two to three days. Uh, sizes, Germans are regiments, brigades, Soviets are uh, rifle divisions, but they break up the mechanized and tank um, divisions into their brigades, I believe. We'll see that as we break it out. So it's the usual kind of switch because the Soviet units uh, were for equivalent name, you know, regiment or brigade, the Soviets were smaller. This is commonly what you see in many games. Uh, for the Eastern Front, and we do see they're going to be doing battles throughout. I think the second volume is out too, which has got battle, a uh, battle from 1941. Um, this one, the battles are from 44. I think their 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 scenarios are going to be focus on a year, two battles from a year, <coughs> from each year. So. <clears throat> They're making a system also that has a capability to span the entire <coughs> eastern front, eastern front conflict. <clears throat> so coming off, we start out with uh, describing the units here, <clears throat> and we do see standard attack, defense, movement. Um, nothing really special there. Uh, the O means optional. We do see a bolded a division ID, and then <clears throat> in this case the regiment ID. So you're going to see that's kind of common. They mention the optional here. Uh, they're going to block off some of these factors to indicate combat shifts. Um, the attack factor blue is an armor combat shift, one right. 
the defensive factor red blocked off means a, uh, I believe, a 1L shift for anti-tank. So it's kind of intuitive there. And then if you do get a block on the uh, last number, which I don't see, but you can see over here and here, that means it's uh, potentially a mech unit. It can move in the mech movement phase, and that's all pretty standard here. Um, HQs are a little different. We do use that for supply. Got to be in range of it. <clears throat> Pick my units that have attack supply, and then they potentially do give common shifts also. And, of course, they've got to be within seven hexes, so they're giving their range here. So third panzer here, uh, if one of their units is within the seven hexes, and they have the right kind of supply, they can get a 1R shift on combat. Uh, all sorts of different types of units here. And we do see we have leader units, somewhat limited. They just add combat shifts. They've got to be stacked with their requisite HQ, within range, proper attack supply, and then you can add it together. So potentially 2R, 1R, you give 3R shift or spread it around. Both sides have air support, um, depending on the scenario. Obviously, the earlier war, you'd see Stukas. Um, and in the later war, the Russians are going to get the Sturmoviks. Um, and there's a concept of air superiority, too. Uh, field forts, there's also forts on the board. They give shifts for combat, reduce uh, losses, <coughs> um, no retreat. And then we have our standard uh, rifle divisions, infantry, uh, armor, panzer. This is mech here. Um, and there are specialist units like here. It appears we have a Tiger. This may just be a battalion, if I'm reading it right, which also gives shifts. Um, you see that right here. <coughs> Heavy armor rules, too. Uh, let's see, we got army level anti tank support units. There's our leader, etc. etc. Okay. Um, in this game, we're going to see, at least for Bagration, we've got Germans, Hungarians. Uh, I didn't see Romanians on the counter sheet. And we've got Soviet and uh, a Polish army that was fighting with them also. Um, the game is all about victory points. Uh, we'll see the setup later here in a second. <clears throat> and then we look at the sequence of play. There, uh, Depending on the scenario, there may be a weather determination phase. Depending on the scenario, uh, there is an air support table. Um, you roll to see how much air support is available. Um, somewhat standard uh, sequence of play here. Place reinforcements. Then we've got our initial supply check. Um, there's three types of supply we'll see later. Attack, general, and out of supply. Uh, looks like there's air supply in future ones. Not in this one. Actually, if you're playing Stalingrad. Uh, and you determine the supply status potentially for each AQ, and then that determines the units under them, and you also have a limited amount of HQs. You can uh, say they've got attack supply, which then allows the units to use their full combat factor, amongst other things. So sort out supply, and then we do initial movement. Everybody can move. Um, Ezoc, enemy Zocs are somewhat sticky. We'll see that later. As soon as you enter, you have to stop, and then next turn, you pay two movement points to disengage. i got to wrestle with that. They may get a whole special disengagement process, but it boils down to two extra movement points to move out of it. You can't go into another EZOC, so you can't go EZOC to EZOC, um, but basically it's just two movement points. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, combat, not mandatory. Key point, supply is rechecked at the moment of combat. That's good to know. And full strength attack is only during attack supply. Okay. Then we follow that with mech movement. Those units that have the blocked off movement factor in general, you're going to see, well, armor, motorized mech, cav, and HQ. Got to be in general supply. If they're out of supply, they're not doing mech move. <coughs> movement allowance in a white box. We saw that. And again, supply status is checked. So if you move too far in the initial phase and got out of supply or combat put you out of supply, you're not going to mech move. What it does say, I didn't see this, is if you're starting the mech move in enemy Zoc, you can still move. So um, that's something to sort out. And then uh, interdiction markers uh, so per scenario. Uh, I think the Bagration, you're not allowed to do air interdiction. So And then move the game turn marker. Okay. 
Let's talk about reinforcements. Uh, pretty much, uh, kind of sum it up. They get uh, there's certain places you can place them. Um, they're going to be on the edge of the board. Uh, they can move their full movement allowance. They're assumed in supply. Um, just to move, and then you got to trace it if they do attack. And there is this railroad entry, move one half MP per hex. Um, but I think it's only on the turn of arrival, and once you leave, you can't use it, so you're not necessarily using it after that. Um, they can be placed over stacked, but by the end of the initial movement, you better have them uh, not over stacked. Okay. And here it is. There is no railroad or strategic movement outside of the ability to place reinforcements. So, in general, the rails are only going to apply when the unit enters for the first time. And it looks like only the turn of entry. So, they'll be getting off the rails. They can be delayed, too, especially if your entry hex is blocked by the enemy. Um, so, those are the reinforcement rules. We move into supply. Three levels attack general out of supply. Uh, and there are cases where we can use major cities. Ooh, they got Berlin in here. Wonder if that means they're going to do a battle for Berlin scenario. That would be pretty awesome. Moscow, Warsaw. Okay. Uh, so let's see. If we come through here, supply sources designated as map edges, cities, or other locations in the scenario rules. Um, key point here: friendly units negate enemy zones of control for supply. That's good. Uh, can't trace supply through swamps. Um, I guess that's these guys right here. I guess we could look at that here. Yeah, that's swamps. I can zoom that in here. Again, sorry about the map. Another call. If somebody can get me a good solid scan of the map, I could easily swap this into this vassal mod here. Um, either map. Both maps. Okay. All maps. Whatever. Whatever you got. Good scans. I'll take them. Uh, let's see, and you can't trace them over major rivers unless there's pretty much a bridge, which is probably indicated by a, uh, like here, a road crossing it here, and they say in cities too, so. All German units, general supply, if they can trace to a supply source. Okay, that's a slight difference. Soviet combat units have to trace to their corresponding HQ, color-coded, within that range. Then the HQ must trace to a supply source. And if a Soviet HQ cannot trace its supply, you can't do general or attack. Okay. And you've got a handful of independent units. They're not attached to any specific group. Six independent units may trace line of sight to a single HQ per turn. Uh, yeah, I'd have to sit down and look at this each turn, but they do put it in a nice little chart here. So that's good. German combat unit can trace line of supply to any supply source, they're in general, uh, to a matching attack supply HQ in range, and the HQ can trace line of sight, then they can be in attack of supply, and then if they can't do either of these, they're out of supply, so that's kind of common sense. Seems the main difference is general supply here. Soviets have to go to their specific HQ, and then that HQ has to be in general supply, so... Interesting, going to have to work through that. And then here's the attack supply again. And another nice little chart here to summarize what they do here. How to supply, general supply, attack supply effects, all here. Attack supply and general supply, you can move your full movement in the initial movement phase. Um, mech move one half, I think it's rounded down. And general supply for mech, they move one quarter. Uh, uh, and then out of supply, one half rounded up. Oh, nice. Maybe it is up. None, none. And then they talk about attack strength. If you're in general supply, you're going to only do one half of combat total, uh, one per HQ per turn. Mm, there. Now that's a new limit right there. I didn't catch that here. Um, oh, and then overrun. You can only overrun when you've got uh, attack supply. Combat total have not individual units. Nice. Defend, uh, you're going to have division core integrity shifts, they're halves, all combat support shifts are halves, my bad, so I can use headquarter and whatever. Only one combat may be initiated per HQ in general supply. Wow, that's a big one. If my HQ is in general supply, only one combat can be provided. That's a big one. 
and then they list here and combat support shifts yeah they've got those there all applicable shifts are totaled and rounded down to a minimum of one so next we move into the zones of control um, as soon as you enter a zoc okay first off only units with an attack factor of non-zero have a zoc um, and it's normally the six surrounding hexes uh, but not across major river hex sides or all sea and do not extend into city they do extend out okay stop moving when you enter Ezoc unless doing an overrun which you can only do when you are in attack supply and it's still at half strength okay but the other ones you cannot overrun and obviously out of supply you cannot um, so let's see and then we got here no additional MP to enter an Ezoc but you can only leave an Ezoc if you're doing an overrun you do the disengagement which is really just plus two MP uh, you're in combat and you do a retreat or advance after combat okay um, and friendly units in Ezoc negate it not for movement but tracing supply and retreat after combat so you can, they'll negate the enemy Zoc so you can retreat um, yeah, and then there may be scenario rules that talk about that. And here's an example, not across the major river, not into the city. Okay, some pretty good examples they give in this set of rules. Uh, overrun is the only form of combat that may happen during the movement phase. Uh, you can never enter a hex containing an enemy unit. Actually, you pay additional movement points and then you resolve the combat. You're not literate. And then if you get a successful result, you can... Advance, and if you have movement left, you can keep going. Uh, a unit must stop when they enter an enemy zone of control and cannot be moved out of it during that movement phase. If you begin an EZOC, you can do disengagement, which is plus 2 MP. Unit may not be moved across a mate. This is kind of strange. A river hex and an EZOC unless, and the example actually helps. Um, this uh, panzer unit wants to cross the major river hex side. Um, but they're both in enemy zones of control. Normally you can't do that, but the first one, hey, there's an enemy. So in this case, I'm negating for the sake of moving across a river. You can do that. And this one, they say this rule, if there's a Zoc here, if the, but if the unit's not adjacent to the river, then I can still cross. So like if the unit was in this swamp, and then the Zoc came from there, I couldn't cross. So that's interesting. It means my force, my main force is along the riverbank. This, in this case, it isn't. So, kind of a slight tweak there. You got to be aware of when you're moving across rivers. Uh, can't expend more MP than you want. Units out of supply have it halved, rounded up. Okay, my bad. Movements are rounded up. Weather may affect it, and here's our you can move one hex rule, unless you have a zero movement factor. Uh, as long as movement is allowed, not Ezoc hex to Ezoc hex or into prohibited terrain. So there you go. You do have one hex minimum movement. Talk about overrun. Following units may oh mech units. These are the mech unit, or the units that can move in the mechanized phase, half or quarter rounded up. There we go. That's key. And terrain effects overrun. Basically, you move adjacent. And then you pay the cost to move into the target's hex plus 2 MP. Yeah, all units within the non-zero attack strength may attempt to overrun in the initial movement phase if you're in attack supply. Um, but all non-zero only mech units, except for CAV. CAV can't, for whatever reason, CAV can move in the mech phase. Well, that makes sense but they can't do overrun, okay? Must be an attack supply at the beginning of their movement. At the beginning of their initial movement, coming out of the supply phase, or at the beginning of the mech movement, supply check before mech. And if you've got the movement points, overrun to your heart's content, barring um, not good results. Uh, the only Zoc you can ignore, enemy Zoc, is the one you're overrunning. I can't do an Ezoc to Ezoc. So if I had a line of enemy units, 
Uh, it's somewhat hard depending on how they're angled. Like I couldn't move here and then overrun if there was a unit here because that would be Ezoc to Ezoc. Okay. Uh, if more than one is, unit is participating, they have to start the turn stacked. Okay. They can separate during advance after, but then they can't overrun together anymore. Uh, this is a special case. We're going to see with combat results if the attacker gets a result of they only take losses and they choose to retreat. The defender can actually advance after combat. Um, only if the attacker is the only one who had the losses and they retreat. That doesn't apply with overrun, though. You can keep overrunning the same unit as long as you got units. Uh, and then the shifts uh, cannot be applied. Okay, armor 18 special shifts can be applied if the applicable units are part of the overrunning force or defending force. HQ and leader bonuses cannot be applied. That's a big one. And then division core integrity, we'll see, <coughs> can be applied. And then they give some good examples. One, two, and this is actually one MP for moving into the hex, well, for the hex they're overrunning, plus two MP for just overrun. So it's one, two, five. And then they go through here and they calculate the odds and all the factor changes, which we'll go over later. Um, we see here this is a little bit more because we've got woods here and the TEC will reveal that that's plus two, plus four. Um, plus two for the woods, plus two for the overrun. Now this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and they got a big section on disengagement, but uh, in general disengagement costs plus two MPs. Uh, mech units can do it during the initial and mech phase. Uh, the only rule is you can't go from EZOC to EZOC. I can't go to a, directly from the EZOC I'm starting the movement phase in to another EZOC. Well, that, that's a common rule. And then I can re-enter, though, if I go to one that isn't one to start. But apparently each scenario, that's probably why, each scenario may tweak this rule. And then they give you examples here. And I don't think based on the example, the I can always move one hex applies. Because for this one, I think it says you can't go here. It's 8 MP. Uh, this one's 5 MP. Yeah, that's what I'm guessing here. I'm inferring from this that the you can always move one hex does not apply if you're disengaging. Units uh, with zero movement, if they are forced to retreat, and we're going to see it basically combat results are step losses, and I can look at that and say if I got three step losses, I can take two step losses and retreat one, or I can take one step loss and retreat two, but if I've got a zero unit, i got to take them all as step losses. We're going to see the same for units in forts. Uh, they just, they lose, you subtract one from the step loss, but they can't retreat either. So they're not allowed to retreat, so they're going to take the step losses. Um, this is something I'm going to have to wrestle with here. Stacking is a tad more complex than normal. Um... 4.5 Regimental Brigade Equivalents, REs, seen that term before, in another game series. And then they tell you how many REs. An Axis Division, well, you only get that normally if you got all three regiments, is three. A Soviet Infantry, well, or Reed Rifle, is two. Uh, I didn't remember seeing any Mountain Divisions going through so far, but that's 1.5. And then we've got uh, Soviet divisions here. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so the rifle divisions are kind of big. Okay. Then we got camp groups, brigades, and regiments, 1RE. HQs are 0.5. Leaders, of course, don't count. So you have to calculate it and never be more than 4.5. Checked at the end of movement phase, uh, initial movement and mech. That's when we check now. Like I said, we can place reinforcements overstacked, but by the end of the initial movement, they better not be. Uh, mech, at the end of the initial mech, meaning you can move through other units, etc. That's just saying at the end you can't be overstacked. If you just decide to do that, the owning player has to eliminate units. Stacking is also checked during the combat phase after retreat and advance. Uh, therefore, your retreats and advances can't overstack, so... Then they give you some examples down here. Okay. All right.
right, now we get into uh, Divisional Core Integrity Bonuses for Combat. Uh, and we do have this console units from the same German Division or Soviet Corps. Same bold font unit ID on right side. Okay, and we saw that when we looked at the units. And in general, you got to have two of the units. Maybe there's three in the core or three in the division. If you've got two, you can get uh, DCI. Combat or overrun, at least two units in the same hex benefit DCI. So yeah, for this is combat and overrun. Combat or overrun defense. I'm sorry, this is attack. Got to be stacked. Defense, two of the constituent units must be adjacent. And then if units from other division cores are present, no DCI. So that's really forcing you to keep your units uh, together. Keep your cores slash divisions um, together to get these shifts in combat and overrun. Uh, DCI is checked during overruns and attacks at the instant of the overrunner attack. And then they give you an example here. The HG division, all three regiments, plus a Tiger Battalion. I guess that's viewed as a support unit. Um, check the 8th Guard, all three brigades. So everybody's here. Uh, Tiger Battalion adds 2 for 11... Seven, one to one. German player gets two R for HG division DCI and one R for the Tiger Battalion. And the Soviets get one L for their DCI. And then here's an example of it on the defense where the units are adjacent. And here's the interesting thing. That's an anti-tank. We're going to see that this will apply to this guy. So this, we've got <clears throat> two units from the 107th, but only one of them has the anti-tank defense. But, the rules say, as long as they're adjacent, they're in this DCI situation, it can uh, pass that shift for anti-tank over here. Now let's see if I'm right or just blowing smoke. Two Soviet infantry divisions, 233rd is attached to it, 232nd. Soviets attack with uh, 6 against 2, 3 to 1, but DCI eligible, so adds 1L. In addition, it's 1L. Now, i got to read this, but this should have been applied to that. I'll have to see where I found that. Um, I did read that somewhere, so let's hold that thought. Uh, combat, total phasing player's discretion, total, meaning it's voluntary. Never compelled to attack. Even if I've got three units in a hex, I can attack with two or one. Like, for example, if HG had a unit from another... Division, I could say that unit's not in the attack, so I get the DCI. Enemy occupied by many, many, as many units that can be brought to bear. And there's untried units. I think you'll see them in the 41 scenarios and maybe late war, Folks Grenadier. Um, let's see. All defending units in a hex must be attacked as a single defensive strength. All attacking units are free to attack together separately or not at all. If a unit is adjacent to more than one occupied, enemy occupied hex, it can attack what it wants. One, some, or all of them. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, just got to be adjacent to everything you're attacking. And the combat strength is unitary. I can't split that. That makes sense. So let's look at combat shifts here. Okay, this is a process. Calculate the combat odds, locally appropriate ratio, before applying any shifts. I'm thinking it's round down. i got to look at that, though. All combat greater than 10 to 1 is 10 to 1. All combat at one to, less than 1 to 3 is 1 to 3. Okay, so I go to just the latest result. All combat benefits must be declared prior to resolution. Determine overall shifts. Yeah, they just add them all up first, they're saying. Uh, then we're going to see the train effects chart add stuff. Uh, and this is nice. We get this review again. What, depending on what supply, this is what happens to your attack and defense. Uh, HQs may provide column shifts, and it's kind of your abstract way of representing uh, higher-level artillery rockets to units in their command, same color only. And if a leader is stacked, they add it too. Air and naval. We don't see naval in this one. And then here's the anti-tank, and I thought this is uh, any mech or armor unit with a blue attack strength gains 1R. 
against any defenders that do not have a blue or red 1L shift. That's good to know. Only one such armor applies. If a specialist armor unit is involved in attack, the attack gains a 2R shift. 1R for the armor and 1R for heavy tanks. If any defending units have a 1R blue shift or a red shift 1L, that cancels 1R armor, but not the 1R specialist. I think it's still just added together. And, oh, any time a specialist armor shift is done on an attack, if the attacker sticks a step loss, they are the first one to lose. That's important here. Didn't catch that the first time through. Any defending unit with a blue attack strength or red defense strength gains a 1L shift. Okay, so the blue attack strength does help for defense. If both an AT capable unit and a specialist AT defensive unit are both present, only one 1L is, is applied. Okay, here's one. Here we go. Many German infantry divisions throughout the series have one regiment marked with a red defense strength. <clears throat> this unit can project it. So we're back to this example. That's strange. So in the previous example, they don't mention this, but this, this, in this example, they do mention that this one projects its anti-tank here to that one. One to one. Hmm. I'll have to go through it. But that's that's what I was referring to. You can project it. Um, Soviet infantry divisions gain a red AT-1L shift as the war progresses. The scenario will say it. Uh, and then if you are attacking and you've got Zox and or units all the way around that thing, uh, it's a concentric attack and you get a one hour, one hour. But they don't apply if the defender is in a city, fortress, or fort. Okay. Combat resolution, round down. Okay, so we calculate the odds round down, calculate all the shifts. Looks like the devil's in the detail here. Roll the die. No unit may be attacked more than once per phase. Yeah, overrun is in the movement phase. It does say before that's it's considered a form of movement, so you can keep overrunning the same unit. Um, combat results affecting the defender are applied to the defender and the same to the attacker. And here's where it gets interesting. And E obviously is eliminated. And then the other results are just step losses. There is an engage result also where pretty much shuts things down. Everybody just sits there. Uh, every unit in a given combat must take one step loss before a second loss. Yeah, the total amount is to the, everybody in the hex, and you've got to evenly divide it, but you can pick who you want unless you used a specialist unit, and they have to take the first step. Uh, let's see. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And then retreats. And, and when I look at it, if I've got a two result, I can say retreat one, take one step, take two steps, or retreat two. Uh, but a retreating unit must be retreated as far away of the result that you take. A unit may never retreat into or through enemy unit or an EZOC that is not negated. So you don't even take it. You just can't. Um, and we don't have to say if you're surrounded by EZOCs, you're eliminated if you have to retreat. No, it just means all your losses have to be taken as steps. Can't retreat off the map. Always conducted by owning player. And they do give you an order. Vacant hex first, uh, then a hex with a friendly unit. And this is interesting. Units retreating through a hex with other friendly units pick up those units and continue to the final hex. Pretty wild there. Picks them up. Then you got to worry about stacking. And if you overstack because of that, you got to retreat one more hex. Uh, zero units can't retreat. And if you uh, retreat across an unbridged major river, you take one additional step loss. Okay, good to know. So, but you can retreat across them. And here they give you a good example of, yeah, if this guy retreat. Let's say these guys get two, two retreats they want to do. They get a two loss, and they don't want to take any losses, so they're going to retreat two hexes. as well. If they retreat here, then here, they're going to drag this guy with them. But if they retreat here, then here, then they're not going to drag this guy with them. And then advance after combat. And the interesting twist here is if the attacker takes all the losses, it's not a split result, 
where the attacker and defender both take losses. If the attacker takes all the losses and they retreat, the defender can advance. So that's a that's new. Um, and if you're advancing into a swamp, and then you you advance along the retreat path, unless it's an E result, and then you're allowed to just go one more hex than the one that you started. Split result prevents the defender from advancing after combat. <clears throat> Got to advance immediately. You don't have to do it if you don't want. Uh, can't attack anymore. Advancing units may cease advancing any hex of the path of retreat. And here's a key one. Advancing units ignore Ezok. And advancing unit may not stray from the path of retreat. And here's your if they're eliminated or... The attacking units may advance into the defender's hex at the attacking players. And if you've got army, mech, motorized, or cavalry, may advance up to two hexes after combat. First hex is a defender's, second hex is adjacent, so I correct that. If a unit's eliminated, <coughs> armor, mech, and motorized can go one more hex. Okay, air support. In general, one player will gain air superiority and have more markers than the other. Some scenarios, both sides or neither side may have markers. Um, and you can only use air support for attacks and overruns. Okay, and then some scenarios will allow you to do interdiction. Uh, only placed on clear hexes adds plus two. And then there's even some with transport. Okay. Then we talk about headquarters, and Third Panzer Corps has two sides. The front indicates if it is in full attack supply, the back if it's general supply. You can tell here the front gives a, oh, this is wrong, but I guess 1R both cases. Sometimes you see 2R for one, and then the other side is 1R. But you got to be in general supply. Attack supply has to be given. The attack has to be within range, upper left corner. Uh, let's see. And this, and if an HQ is destroyed, replaced in the next reinforcement phase, deployed at the owning player's discretion, like other reinforcements. Uh, let's see. Modifiers. Yeah. Combat strength. And then we've got our leaders here. They pretty much got to be stacked with the uh, appropriate HQ, and they just add their shift here. 2R, 2R on the attack, Guderian, 1L on the defense. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see, nothing here. Leaders must, be sta must always be stacked with their named HQ. And if the HQ is eliminated, it'll come back, but they don't come back and they're halved when the HQ is out of general supply or out of supply the, it's the strength there then they talk about untried units which I don't think apply to bagration no a number of Soviet units in early battles and Axis units and later <coughs> are untried or they're non mobilized is determined at the first instance of combat by rolling on the scenario untried unit table. Nice. And uh, they may have two steps, may have one step, who knows. Some scenarios will have weather. Uh, and then we've got on map printed fortresses. Don't think I have any over here. I'll have to go efficient, but I'm not seeing any. And you can also have make your fort markers. And on map printer to get a uh, 2L defensive shift. And if they're in a city hex, it's 3L. Uh, can't choose. You, you uh, Losses incurred by the defender are reduced by 1. But uh, can't choose retreat. Ignore retreat results. I don't know if you'd call it ignore. Is you can't retreat. Got to take it all as step losses. And they're never out of supply. On map fortresses only benefit the side that controls them at the start of the scenario are destroyed once occupied. I don't have a fortress destroyed marker though that I saw. And then you can build forts. 
and it looks like you can be busy with this. Basically, if a unit's not in ESOC, doesn't move, and I'm assuming it has to be in supply, you can build a fort. And this one, it looks like, gives 1L. Okay. And they cancel the concentric attack. No naval units, and I didn't see any bridging units. So, let's see. And here we've got a nice sequence of play, which I'll definitely be using as I start the game and start to learn it. Let's take a look at some other stuff real quick before we draw this to a close. <clears throat> Here's a player aid card. Here's our combat results table, and you do see it's a basically number slash number. First number is attacker, second is defender. <clears throat> and the asterisk means you must take at least one step loss. Yeah, I think that says there. An asterisk result always includes in one step loss. I can't do three retreat. i got to do one step loss, two retreat. Here's our eliminated. And here's our, we just talk to each other. So the one to three, yeah, not a good thing. I could end up, if I'm attacking a one to three, I could end up annihilating myself. Oh, the, the other thing is all these results are attacker only. So if I attack at one to three and I choose to retreat, that means a defender can advance. Good to know. Here's a combat shift summary chart. That's pretty handy based on all the ones mentioned. So we can go through here, armor unit, and it gives a special here, AT unit, specialist units, leaders, HQs, and the different attack, defense, overrun. So this is handy. Here's our supply effects chart, <coughs> which we saw in the rules. Good to have it here. And terrain effects. Clear one, woods two mech, one infantry. Minor river plus one. You can cross rivers. Plus three or plus two. X. Oh, here's the road negates it. <coughs> and that Ezoc rule. So good summary here. Good summary. It even talks about supply here. So here's your shifts. Okay, so this is good useful charts here and see how they work when playing the game. So it looks all here. <clears throat> then they've got this turn record check, offensive display. Um, it's just basically a turn record check, but you do see they've got notations for the specific scenario. <clears throat> third turn, the Hungarians leave. And the 39th Panzer leaves on the seventh turn, only for the Bagration scenario, not the Sando Merits, I don't know how to pronounce that word. And then they, it, now we do see that the DCI bonus may change from scenario to scenario, but in this case, it's the same here. German Panzer, Panzer Grenadier are motorized. Attack, they get a 2R DCI. Downs 2L. Overrun, they get a 2R. More reasons to keep your units together. Best infantry can do is a 1L. On defense, German infantry, and then Soviet arm mech and GCC. So Soviet rifle divisions, well, we'll see later Soviet rifle divisions are entire divisions. Yeah, see here. I mean, there's no here because it's the whole thing. Uh, but I think it's a core. But let's see what they got. Soviet armor, mech, and guard cavalry corps. That's what that is. Those are the only units that get DCI in these. 1R, 1L, 1R. Okay. And then we've got our air support table. Uh, die 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, 1 to 2. Soviet 2 times 1R. Soviet get 1R. And oh, a third of the time the <coughs> Axis Stukas slip in, sleep in, even though it's 1944. But you can see pretty much the Soviets, uh, at least for the 1944. Scenarios here, uh, air superiority seems to be in their favor. Okay, and let's see, I think I do have the scenario I'm going to play here, the Bagration. You'll see it's only, scenario rules are not that long. Um, they give you a brief description of the battle, and that's it, which is kind of different than from spy decision games. They usually love to give you a detailed uh, description of the battle. Um, let's see. Soviet player has one R air support shift for the first turn instead of rolling on the air support table. So 
first turn it's 1R and then after that you roll. No air interdiction. <clears throat> Don't have to do that. Uh, and then they give your supply sources. All northwestern map edges, city hexes of Warsaw, uh, northern and southern here. Both German Army HQ units are considered an attack supply for the entire length of the game. Wow. Unless they're out of supply. Soviet here. Uh, the Soviet only ignores the major river line of supply restriction because they had lots of pontoon bridges. Okay, so they can chain, draw supply over major rivers. <clears throat> and they can't put all their units in attack supply because they were at, in this battle operating at the limit of, of their supply for this last push. And we do see turn one, all are in attack supply, and there's their attack supply markers. And then the beginning of each turn, second to the end, one Soviet H key is put in general supply. Move the remaining attack supply markers to the current turn box. I wonder if you can keep moving them. 70th Army enters an attack supply. Picks any three attack supply markers from the first five game turn boxes. Place some of them in the 10. This is interesting. And then pick one of them. Flip to general supply. And then flip the remaining HQ to general supply, leaving the three resupplied game term eight armies for the final turn. Hmm, gonna have to look at that. Let's figure this out here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hungarians, mandatory. Yeah. Specified corresponding HQ room. Um, let's see. There's withdrawal three Hungarian infantry divisions. Withdrawn at start of game turn three. 39th Panzer HQ is removed on turn seven. And any units part of the 39th Panzer go to the 9th Army. Okay, so you're just moving the HQ out. Uh, and then the Germans may deploy any two eligible units or all eligible units of one division per turn. Uh, you remove them from the map. And if they're mech, they're on the turn record chart one turn ahead. <coughs> if they are infantry, place them on the turn record chart two turns ahead. And then they enter as reinforcements. Okay. I have to look at the initial setup of the units, but maybe we got to, you know, they're going to get sliced and diced. Uh, the German lines has two Tiger Battalions at a 1R. Okay. The German has three AT regiments can be used by non-mech units when it gain a 1L when attacked by mech. Folks Grenadiers pay an additional 1 MP to in, disengage. So that's our only difference there. And, oh, here they are. Sickle hexes. And any time Soviet units may cross the Vistula into or out of these hexes at plus one MP via a road bridge hex side. Huh. I'll have to look at that, I think, here. Um, for other hex sides, infantry units, one MP, mech plus two. Okay, I'll have to think about that. And then here's the victory points. Um, Got to mark these somehow to identify these when I do the setup. Uh, and if they get every two Soviet control hexes west of Vistula or Nestrest of Naro with no German units within two, and if you can get the Hungarians before they're withdrawn. Yep, so you don't have game turns one and two. And then we get the split. And then we have the setup here. And you'll see in general it's uh, place them here and then everybody can be within three hexes. Like the 8th Guard of Army has like 10 or 11 rifle divisions. So they've got to be within three hexes of here. And this and this and this. Then we got reinforcements. Game turn 1, 69th Army, 28th Army. Looks like they're entering the map board. And there's the 70th. The only thing on the board for the 8th Guards, 1st Polish, 2nd Tank, and the 47th. And then on the first turn, these all move in too. Okay. And the Germans get reinforcements on game turn 3. And it doesn't look like they're just individual units. And then we see the axis set up. So, 
I'm going for this one. So I think what I need to do is figure out this a little bit more, this tax apply. Put some kind of marker on these victory point hexes because I don't think they're marked. Probably set up the Germans, get a feel. So there's a little get a feel for what's going on here. And then we can put this game through its paces. And like I said, based on what we see here and maybe the other scenario, decide whether it's worthwhile to invest in the current and upcoming volumes of this series. Um, you know, will this turn into the operational game series for the Eastern Front? And then, of course, if it's really good, they can move it to other fronts. Who knows? Okay. So there you go. That's my um, kind of more detailed review. I'm going to have to work through this some more. There are, yeah, this is not your just standard, I mean, some of it's pretty much your standard moves off kind of stuff, but there's enough twists and turns in these rules that have to be understood to play it properly. So this will be interesting to play out here. So anyway, I've gone way long here. So if you're hung on this long, thank you. Um, otherwise, like, comment, subscribe, etc. But hopefully the next video we'll be seeing the setup and discussing the strategy and maybe getting some playing in place. So again, thanks for listening and we'll see you at the next recording.